now live and um, people will start jumping in and it started recording as well. Um, so Hemi, maybe around like five or 501 or something like that, I'll leave it to you. We can, we can start it off. Enjoy. Cool. How's your, how's everyone's weekend? So we'll have a cutter care to start off with, um, brother. All right. And then, uh, um, Poto Mihi Fakatau. All right. And then I'll just chat about a few things and then we can have a discussion, huh? So I'll open with the karakia, mihi, and then my hope if I go to before yours. Yep, kapoi the faka uti, that means to respond, team. And apologize for the uh, airport announcements, boarding, and the ding dongs. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other quiet here yet, because the whole airport's like that, right? Unless I go outside. Were you there on Saturday, um, Sunday, Tayaba? Tayaba? No, uh, yeah. Courageous conversations? I was meant to be, but I, unfortunately I had something else come up. So. Oh, I, I saw your name on the yeah. list, huh? Yeah. 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 And I said, oh, yeah. Tayaba will be there. Sorry, I, I sorry to have missed you, but I hear it went really well, which is awesome. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Um, it's always, I think, you know, um, we are the converted. <laughs> um, it's really actually, how do we encourage um, the majority? Uh, and they're not necessarily uh, Pākehā people, but majority in organisations to give it a fair go, to create the environment us to participate um, yeah how do they do that because you know interesting thing I, in the marae situation um, the environment is there so everybody's welcome um, but then when the speeches start in fai kōrero, um then people feel oh I don't actually know what they say <laughs> And so, uh, you know, even in that situation, people left out. So there's, it's a two-way thing for me. It's um, not only creating the environment and the conditions, but also uh, personal confidence. Uh, that's very important. Just like um, probably going to the council or to hospital, uh, going to see the doctor. Um, it's very welcoming, but if you don't know what to ask for or how to put it or be persistent, um, then you pers pers personally might feel um, inadequate or feel lesser. Aina <laughs> 
No reira māku e tīmata hea i roto i te kupu karake ana ka tika nāti ki tō tātai kau, ki tō tātou kai hau tū whanaunga tanga a iwi, hai whakautu. No reira ki e noi tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai. E hi ake ana te ātā, kura he tio, he uka, he hauhu, ti he wa mauri ora. Kā ti rā, nau mai haere mai e koutou mā, Nau mai ki te nei hui e kōrerohi ākene mō atu āhua tanga o te nonoho ki roto e au te aurua, me ona tu āhua tanga e pāna ki te whakawhanaunga tanga a iwi. Nei rā te mihia te ake o koutou, nau mai, piki mai, kake mai, huri kau anō te kakau o te paipa, te tokotoko o rākau ki ākoe kai te rangatira ming. Tēnā koe. E te rangatira e hemi. Tēnā koe mō tō karike whakapuare tātou hui o te ahilai tōnei me ki o mihi whakatau kia ngai tātou ko whakaemi nei kei rō i tēnei hōtaka. Kei raro i te koro wai o te Race Relations Day o tīra e hara te rā anake, ia rā, ia rā mātou e tautoko, mātou e kōrero e pāna me pēhe tātou ki te hāpai, te wairua o te whakawhanaumatanga. E te parata, kā mihi ki a koe me ki tēnā nō tātou ki a tātou mate huiua, rātou ki whitu rangitia. Haere, haere, haere atu rā, to all our friends and families that have passed on our heartfelt thanks for your contribution to us, for the Aroha that you have left for us to continue and the hopes and dreams that you have left for us to pursue. Ka mihi ki a rātou mā. Awesome team. Um, thank you very much for joining us today on Race Relations Day. And I did say it wasn't just one day, but every day is um, relationships. And relationships are just so key to the fundamental social fabric the culture, the well-being, not only the uh, social, uh, environmental, spiritual well-being, but also it actually contributes to um, uh, economic well-being in terms of uh, how well we do, um, the uh, opportunities for employment, the opportunities to be acknowledged for our talents and all that sort of stuff. I actually was in the... Um, uh, the National Museum, uh, National Library today, um, where the uh, team from Te Ao um, actually launched Whakatika. Um, let's make it better or make it correct um, regarding racism towards Māori. And they had 2,000 respondents um, facetiously, uh, they said, you know how Māori love to fill in forms in a quick to off the mark to actually fill in surveys. Well, it took them four years and they have been um, to many wānanga, to many hui Māori, to sports organisations, kapahaka, and um, encourage um, their whānau to actually fill in the survey. And it was, um, the findings are not new. Um, they have been articulated in the past. They have been broadcast in the past before. Um, yesterday, um, I was at uh, Courageous Conversations where they've set a, a charitable trust led by Ripeka Evans. Uh, we had a wānanga at Waipapa Marae. Uh, we were talked about uh, past, current and future. Um, Probably the future part is the hardest part to actually come up with solutions um, and how we can actually change hearts and minds and, and encourage people to uh, promote and, and have better relationships and race relations in our country. And um, just this morning, um, I had an interview with uh, Mike Hoskins, and you know how Mike Hoskins goes. Uh, because there was a, a council of FSO uh, from uh, the Auckland Council said that 10 7 program has to go because it unfairly uh, focuses on Māori Pacific and it is racist. 
And so um, I supported that call in terms of the program is uh, badly profiling or unduly profiling Māori Pacific um, in 10.7. Um, I did not say delete it because it does actually have a role to play in terms of community policing and uh, make sure that there is still confidence in New Zealand police in our communities, um, our communities um, ringing the police to give information to catch the people that need to be caught. Um, aroha to the family in Epsom. Um, unfortunately, um, there was a, a real bad incident of seemingly domestic issues that had gone badly wrong. And so we are challenged with many issues, um, not only in terms of structural racism, um, but also, um, unfortunately, uh, when tensions are high, like COVID, it has actually brought another level of um, racism highly against Māori and Chinese, Asian people. And we just had the unfortunate issue, whether it is uh, race-related or not, but definitely in Atlanta, where um, a gunman went and shot a number of Asian people. So we are very aware that this micro um, aggressions uh, can actually lead to uh, real bad, sad consequences. And we've had the uh, Royal uh, Commission report uh, saying that there were undue resources from the New Zealand police and the New Zealand SIS focusing on the Muslim community and not looking at the uh, white supremacists and other sites that actually could. And unfortunately, it was a big tragedy of terrorism where 51 souls lost their lives and many victims are feeling still the pain today. Um, but I wouldn't be in this job and I am think you wouldn't be in this job if we didn't have great hope um, in terms of that we can, while we are alive, we can actually make things better. And we've got a big job to do and I'm really happy um, to be part of um, supporting the lead of the Ministry of Justice in terms of the National Plan Against Racism. And I think it's going to be a uh, very transformative um, national action plan uh, from how it's going to be implemented. The implementation is very important. And so we nowadays have um, social licenses to operate um, whether it's um, employment through um, tendering for roads and houses in the government. So everybody has to have apprenticeships. Uh, we used to have sweatshops and we fought against those. And, uh, you know, that protest has improved. Hopefully some of this working uh, situations for people overseas. Uh, we've had ethical uh, products like coffee and um, other products um, that we don't, should not buy coffee and put pressure on people not to cut down rainforests. Uh, very, just the other day, we had um, Air New Zealand being called out for fixing engines for the Saudi Arabia um, um, Air Force because they were bombing Yemen. And so these social political issues are not new only today, but even going back, and since the Treaty of Waitangi had been signed, Māori had protested the suppression of language, nuclear free, women's voting, uh, bad policy, racist policies against Chinese people, uh, apartheid in Pukekohe, Māori in uh, Pākehā and Indians had to go to different parts go to another toilet on the other side of the bus, can only sit on this side of the theatre. So we have a whole history of it, but we're really looking forward to probably discussing some of the solutions going forwards, team. So come mihi ki a koutou. Uh, tēnā koe e te rangatira, e te kai hautu uh, Ming Foon. Um, thanks for joining in. We, we acknowledge that you're in between flights. And um, 
thank you for sharing your time with us and your and your reflections um uh, this afternoon yes you're right um 21st of march is race relations day it was officially yesterday for us but as you say um it, it, uh, the celebrations and and events go beyond race relations day itself into the coming weeks and months ahead and we're pleased to be hosting this this online panel uh today uh, I think another reflection also, Ming, is that March has even become more symbolic, requiring us to pause and reflect and honour the memory of the protesters that, uh, that died in South Africa in 1960 and, and most recently in the last two years, the Shuhara who were killed on our shores in the name of racism and ignorance. Um, so just a little bit of uh, kōrero about the theme for... for um, for this year and I'll introduce our panellists. So every year the, the Commission works, uh, puts out a call for interest and we've worked alongside Multicultural New Zealand. have decided the theme this year is e haere tahiana, a walking together. Uh, and that idea is no matter what communities we may belong to in Aotearoa, we are all, we are all navigating uh, this journey of a more inclusive society grounded on te tiriti o waitangi. And the journey is made easier when we support one another. This reflects the whakatauki kia whakatōmuri te haere whakamua. I walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed on my past. If we are to truly respect and create a multicultural Aotearoa, we must look to the past to inform the future. So ladies and gentlemen, to all our participants who have joined today, welcome. Welcome. We are recording this session, so if you did miss or, you, or if you miss part of it, if you have to leave early, you can um, you can check back with the recording and catch up with some other recorded. Uh, so our first the panelist, Tayaba Khan, founder of CEO of Khadija Leadership Network, the New Zealand Peace Ambassador for the European Muslim League, a civil servant and a community develop, development practitioner with over 15 years of experience having worked with the migrant and refugee communities in the occupied territories of Palestine, Australia, the United Kingdom and here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Tayaba currently sits on the governance board of Mixit and Belong Aotearoa. She is also a regular panellist on RNZ to the panel and the AM show. Our second panellist is Josiah Tuala Mali. Welcome Josiah. Um, Josiah was born in Dunedin into a Samoan Kiwi family, which moved north to Christchurch when he was six. His background is in authentic youth participation and assisting Pacific and other communities to share their voices in many different spaces. In 2018, Josiah served as the youth voice on the government inquiry into mental health and addiction. Alongside the Rata Foundation, he is also a board member of Pacific Wellbeing Lead Leva and the Psychotherapy Board. Our third panellist is Dr. Arma Rata, belongs to Ngā Ruahine, Te Ngā Koe, Taranaki and Ngāti Maniopoto. She is a key researcher on the MBIE-funded program of research WERO, working to end race, racial oppression, oppression, and her research interests include iwi connectedness, Māori voting, Māori migrant relations, and settler colonial racism. Um, we are expecting Julie Zhu to join us at uh, 5.30. She is running late. Um, coming from another important meeting. Uh, born in Xi'an, China, and raised in Tamaki Makoto, Julie is a filmmaker and storyteller uh, committed to championing marginalized voices and stories. She directed short documentary East Meets East for Loading Docks in 2017 and has created content for Māori television, the spin off TV New Zealand On Demand and RNZ. She currently co directs and co hosts podcasts and video series. Conversations with my immigrant parents for RNZ. The second series of our podcast, Immigration with Immigrant Parents, with my immigrant parents, can also be found, and we can put up that that link to that um, to that podcast later on in the webinar. And we can um, welcome Julie once she does arrive. So over to the panelists for uh, um, to respond. Kia ora, no mai, hi mai. You might direct somebody, Chief. Okay, so let's get let's get some questions happening. So, Tayaba, 
Um, tell us about your organization, Khadija Leadership Network, and the mahi you've been doing, and do you see it playing a part in race relations in Aotearoa, New Zealand? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Sorry, Hemi, I was trying to wait for your cues, though we have like, a, you know, a format. Um, so as you said, I am the founder and CEO of Khadija Leadership Network. It's an organization that serves Muslim women and men uh, from all walks of life. Uh, that's worked out organically, actually, um, in terms of where they see themselves going uh, professionally or personally. So that's the organization. We are really the backbone. Um, and we came, we came about uh, based on personal experiences of knowing that something was missing around community support to, so, you know, to get people to, to land where they think they should be landing. So we're very much about personal and professional development. However, um, things changed when we when we started, you know, so 2017, the organization is very, very young. Um, and 2018 was the only year we were able to really set ourselves up. Uh, and then 2019, March 15th happened. So it really changed the course of what it was that we intended to do versus what it is we've ended up doing. Um, and so organically have walked into a very human rights um, advocacy space as leaders who want to make sure that we do show that we have position uh, or positions on issues in the world that affect us all, not just the Muslim community. So that's really what KLN does. That's how we're, um, you know, organically we've been branded. Um, and so we've commented on a range of issues that are race relations um, issues uh, that are, are all about what's the place of Muslims in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but also what's the place of ethnically diverse communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So how do we all come together and live um, in, a, in a tolerant way? So our work has just, you know, um, organically become about that. And I think there's, there's a long way to go, as um, Ming rightfully said, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so that, that's us in a, in a very sort of short, succinct way. Uh, can I say that, um, yeah, just, just if you have any questions that come up, um, you can pop them in the chat. One of my colleagues is uh, keeping an eye on the chat, so you can pop them in the, in the chat or uh, um, note them down and, and we can raise them later on in the Q&A session. Uh, I guess the next question is for you, just Josiah. Uh, you've done some amazing mahi for rangatahi in Aotearoa and in specific youth, Pacific youth. Uh, this mainly involves mahi within the mental health space. What started your journey and how did you think mental health is significant when dealing with issues of race unity in Aotearoa? Malo lava le soifua maua malalangi mama tēnā koutou ko wai auko Ko vai te monga, ko vai lima te awa, ko Aotearoa fitu fa fitu toko waka, no te poti a hau ke o te tahi e noho ana, ko te saa ta viti toko i ngoa. Uh, and Carlo Fai, much much love to you all. Apologies, I'm kind of not the best coverage zone, um, and so you, it may or may not sound like I'm on a plane, but I can assure you, I'm not on a plane. I'm not anywhere near a plane. It's just coverage. But um, but to come to your question, fafutai e me and fafutai. Uh, Mato and Ming for the opportunity to be here alongside our team. Um, maybe simply, it was partly my community seeing that Pacific young people and our lived experience of being Pacific here in Aotearoa was something that we could share to make Aotearoa a better country. And as part of that too, we come with so many intersections and, uh, and pretty early on I, I experienced depression and I got some wonderful support for that. And and, and journeying through that and then telling the story when it was the right time and my family support, that kind of set me on that path to hopefully encourage other rangatahi and everyone in Aotearoa that we all have mental health and particularly for us in, um, in minority communities or communities that, um, you know, are large in other ways, we 
might not have had some of our family speak about having getting, got that support in the past. But I think in our own stories, in our own ways, we had that support. And it might have been car- through carving, it might have been through weaving, it might have been through our tohunga, our tofunga, and our other cultural knowledge holders. And so it's actually not any weakness of us drawing on those things or finding those things again. Uh, if anything, we are actually better understanding uh, and, and actually reasserting our cultural value and that Aotearoa benefits from when it, when it sees us experiencing our and, and celebrating our ways of being because actually everyone wants to be themselves ultimately and and when they can see it in someone else and it's pro-social, it's very helpful for everyone. Mm. I tēnā koe just a malo lava. Malo lava and um, thank, you, thank you also for raising... Um, you know, some of your own personal challenges, it, it, it takes a lot of um, personal strength um, and, and self-awareness to raise that. And, and I'm sure those, those of us on the call will hold that with, with dignity uh, and, and honour. Um, can, can I supplement your question? Um, you were also involved in the Black Lives Matters march and the petition that led to the scrapping of the armed police teams last year. Do you see a place for many communities coming together to raise human rights issues and demand action? Absolutely. I probably would just want to note that I have a very, very, very tiny involvement with Black Lives Matter. As a Pacific person, we have an absolute affinity with what Black Lives Matter is about and what's going on, but it's not our lived reality in the same, same way. So I would just keen to chuck that in there but in terms of how we can stand in solidarity with others to ensure that the best outcomes come for everyone that's that's what we were trying to do when we made the petition which has been signed by 30,000 people 30,000 New Zealanders said it's actually not helpful when the police have decided to take up arms and predominantly Māori and Pacific and and multi-ethnic communities without talking to us about what might be the best way to, to lead to the outcomes they're hoping for. So if we're hoping for a new way of living together, actually journeying with the whanau who can tell you how to best do that is, is great at honouring human rights and it leads to better outcomes. So that's what the 30,000 of us who signed that petition took it to Parliament said, and full credit to the police, full credit to the new commissioner who decided actually that's not what the police want to be about. The police want to, want to journey with us. And, and so that's the thing I'd probably encourage anyone. And at the moment, the Polynesian Panthers are, are demanding an apology and speaking to the government about that. And some of us in our uh, Pacific youth community have been um, saying, let's toe talk with the Panthers and write letters to our decision makers to say, actually, you know what? It, there is still a pain from that time. And it is great when the state can can acknowledge what has happened. And so absolutely that the our country becomes more and more and more of what it's supposed to be and absolutely aligning with what Tetsiriti calls us to live by. I mean that's for those of us who are Toiwi or have other relationships, that's that's our foundation for standing here. So I think in, in terms of speaking for Tetsiriti, speaking for the well being of others, we get the country that everyone deserves. Children. Tēnā koe, tēnā koe, uh, Arama, uh, thank you very much for your uh, responses. Um, ka huri te, te tokotoko ki a koe, Arama. Often, and, and it was a good segue from Josiah's mention of Te Tiriti, often there are misconceptions about a place for multiculturalism in Aotearoa. How do you see Te Tiriti as a mechanism for inclusivity and belonging? and where we all have a place here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kilda, lovely to be here. Um, I'm a bit jealous that I'm not with Josiah. Are you on a boat? <laughs> I couldn't, I'm very distracted by those fishing rods behind you. Um, <laughs> it's very cool. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to call it all about these things. Um, the question of um, multiculturalism and biculturalism seems to be one that still comes up a lot. So it's kind of a bit of a debate that seems to be going round and round. And I think what focusing on whether or not this country is a bicultural country or a multicultural country functions to do is to obscure what the country actually is, right? Which is monocultural. So um, HRC, I know that you've just recently um, release a report looking at discrimination that new migrants experience in, in Aotearoa 
and um, you know this Malatest International did interviews across the country talking to many many different communities and you know again and again people would say when I turn up um, in public in my workplace in my school I can't bring my whole self I have to hide certain parts of myself I have to try to dress and speak and act in a certain way to fit into these monocultural institutions we have around the country and so um, yeah I, I do like to bring to the fore that we are living in a monocultural um, country as far as our state institutions go. Um, I also I feel really sad that um, the way that it's kind of weaponized against our different communities. So um, if there's an ask from Māori, we're told, no, this is a multicultural country. If there's an ask from other ethnic communities, they're told, no, this is a bicultural country. And I, I feel like there are many migrants who feel that to be part of New Zealand, they have to buy into this idea of biculturalism and it's symbolic only, right? So they're having to um, do that. But in doing so, it's like denying their own marginality um, in order to to belong here um, which I think is is a shame but I don't think that it's a, a, a battle between one or the other I think um, you know Josiah was speaking really beautifully about solidarity between different communities and how we can work together and um, yes absolutely Māori deserve reparations for what we've experienced at the hands of the crowd yes absolutely Pacifica communities deserve to be compensated for what they've experienced at the hands of the crown and we shouldn't think that the pool of resources is limited and that we're in competition for, for those resources and yes absolutely um, those who lost, lost loved ones through the Christchurch terror attacks due to government failure should be given compensation and it's it's a real shame that we haven't seen any action there. Um, in terms of te tiriti, um, I think that, that presents a huge opportunity. Um, you know, te tiriti was our first immigration policy document. It said that there is a place for non-Māori um, in Aotearoa and, you know, if we uphold te tiriti, then, um, then there should be no problem with that, right? Um, I also see a huge opportunity in um, the current emphasis that's being placed on constitutional transformation. So um, for any of our um, viewers who are unfamiliar with Matiki Mai, it was a report um, written by Moana Jackson, Margaret Mutu, Veronica Tafai and others after extensive consultation with Māori communities about what they wanted our constitutional arrangements to look like. Um, and so it provides a bl blueprint for power sharing that would give full expression to Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And I think there's a real opportunity as Māori push for that for other marginalised communities, other communities whose needs are not served by the current constitutional arrangements to imagine the type of society that they would like to have and to work in solidarity with Māori to push for those types of changes. So um, that's, I think, where it is very hard with um, you know, we've just come out of a really difficult week that people have referenced the, um, the anniversary of the Christchurch terrorist attacks, the shooting that took place in Atlanta. Um, it is sometimes difficult to find hope, um, but I think um, my hopes are currently pinned on trying to get constitutional transformation by 2040. Kia ora tēnā koe, mō, mō au whakaaro rangatira. Thanks for sharing your critical thinking with us, um, Arama Koto Katoa, to all the panelists. Um, just wanting to check if if we have. Uh, oh, sorry, if we have Julie with us yet. Um, it doesn't look like we have um, Julie on board yet, um, and she may not be able to join because she's caught up with other mahi. Um, so yeah, but we'll make sure we have her at a different time. Apologies for that. Okay. Um, shukran, shukran, Shema. Um, so I, I guess I guess we can we can dive into some of these general questions for uh, whoever wants to pick up up on it from the panel, um, and just re realise that we've got limited time with um, with Commissioner Foon. Um, so so I, I think. Given, given the previous conversations we've just had um, about the tension between biculturalism, multiculturalism and monoculturalism, um, is, is, would, 
what would a society that values racial and ethnic differences look like? Um, and what, what hopes and of course fears may come up for you thinking about that society? Open question to all the panelists and uh, Commissioner Fern. Sure, I'm keen to go if you can hear me all right, and that's good, sweet. Well, um, yeah, in 2018, as you talked about earlier, I got to be on the Mental Health and Addictions Inquiry, and we came up with a series of 38 recommendations oh, that the government accepted, but there's 40 of them in total. Um, underpinning those was four things that we said would make a difference to how Aotearoa could be. And, and to, sort of in an indirect way, this is answers what, what, this is my take on what you've asked. But that for the future Aotearoa needs, we need to honour te tiriti, we need equity, we need to be people's first in everything that we do, and then we need to build on the foundations we already have. And to me, that, that if we were to do those four things across every area of policy and just how we live together, that would centre where, where the rebalance has to be. We have to make up for the cultural degradation that institutional racism and institutional processes have on whānau hapu iwi retaining their cultural rights and ways of being, and then also empower other people to live their cultural, their cultural expression. So as a, and I suppose as part of situating that too, New Zealand has still got a colony. New Zealand still has Tokelau, which is a dependent state of New Zealand, and it has two other countries in free association with New Zealand. We're still in Polynesia, and that's not that doesn't take away from the treaty relationship. So I suppose you know these things can coexist, um, and when and deconstructing what is the current model, but also building on what's good in the way we live together today, and having equity and tertiality and and keeping it about our people, we'll get to where we need to be. Josiah. Uh, I think um, Kilda Josiah, uh, Talo Fafa um, I think the uh, journey of getting there is sometimes more exciting than the end product. Um, but I think the journey initially will be that. The majority needs to uh, accept and account for what has happened, and uh, I think there has is um, starting to be a bit of a sea change in the conversations that are happening, uh, especially in the uh, systemic and structural uh, racism area, uh, more particularly in the government. Uh, Marama Davidson. Um, uh, called out um, one of the MPs and um, what I was talking to Adrian uh, Rufi today and he says, I don't know when was the last time an MP actually called out another MP and called them racist. Um, and so I think the, the brave conversations are starting to happen. Um, I think there are more, there is more um, more reason to do this now, unfortunately, but it is a good start. And the conversations, more particularly on the treaty, um, is finding resonance in, in the government. Um, you know, big ups to Nanaya for allowing um, a Ori te uh, pieces of legislation to allow uh, Māori to be on councils without having going through a two-step process. I know that there's going to be um, a Māori Health Authority um, that will be uh, probably be announced in the next budget. Uh, te Hōkai uh, Rangi uh, um, from corrections, a, a, a strategy from corrections. It's uh, finding finding that the stats uh, for um, imprisonment has reduced significantly. And so, uh, but there's the other issue of how do we prevent uh, people from going there? I think racism is just actually one part of the um, harmonious community conversations. There's 
a whole lot of other ills in our community as well. But they do say statistically that racism uh, contributes significantly to um, what we are going through at the present time. Um, cycling back to an earlier conversation, Aroma, we've got a question from one of our attendees. How do you handle situations where two vulnerable groups are pitted against each other? How can we create more unity? Yeah, I think that's something that happens a lot, isn't it? Um, certainly in the research that I've been doing, like a lot of the um, source material that um, people are using, um, there are a lot of assumptions underpinning that. And one that's quite um, common is that, oh, Māori people don't like Chinese people, for example. Um, and I think there are lots of different ways to respond to something like that. And I'm sure people watching will have their own um, great ideas as well. Um, two that spring to mind um, is having a look at that um, critically and, and, and thinking about what, what the contradictions are to that. So, okay, so you're presenting this argument that Māori don't like Chinese people. Well, what, what evidence do we see to the contrary of that? And, you know, there, there are lots of examples of good relationships between Māori and Chinese people, um, for example. Um, and also, where do these discourses come from? So tracing, tracing that back. And um, if we do that, we see that um, there has been a really long campaign that pits Māori and Chinese communities against each other. So, um, you know, right back to um, the Crown trying to um, prevent um, migrants from Asia coming um, and framing that as being because they're a threat to Māori. So we had like, you know, those really racist cartoons that appeared in, in early newspapers that some of you may have seen. So yeah, tracing the whakapapa of some of those ideas and looking for evidence to the contrary. Um, but, but really I think it, um, the most important thing is to, to look at the structures that affect us all. And um, uh, Ming and I were on a panel discussing um, immigration just a few days ago and People often talk about um, the surge in immigration that we're currently experiencing, and you know why are people um, clamouring to move to Aotearoa? And um, I think from a Māori perspective, it's very easy for us to look to our own history to understand why people migrate. So if we look to our own history, we can see that um, uh, we didn't just decide to move to urban centres; we did so because our economies were systematically destroyed by the crown and when we look at New Zealand's role in the world and the organizations that we're a part of like the WTO, the World Bank, the IMF and the way that we destroy the economies of other countries which then displaces people and forces them to move here we understand that colonialism is not just something that happened locally and that these imperial kind of forces are impacting people's lives in many different ways. And if we, we look at our histories and those connections, um, we can understand what our relationship is to one another and where those similar experiences happen while appreciating and holding space for our, our difference. And of course, um, you've cited the, um, uh, the um, the report um, from Melitest International around um, uh, migrant people's experiences of racism, and Ming also brought up about the the um, Maori experiences of racism um, research and the findings. Um, so here's another question from from our participants: How did you all navigate growing up as members of minority groups in Aotearoa, New Zealand? Has it gotten better? And what changes are urgently needed to anyone? I'll just tell you one little story. Um, look, I, I, I was probably more in a fortunate position <laughs> than some of my fellow colleagues, um, but definitely um, going to school, um, probably having a shop actually helped. Um, having some lollies in my pocket helped. Um, but what really helped? was actually, you know, we used to get a few taunts, right? But really it's about that stereotyping and, and how people view people. 
Um, so they didn't have much of a view about Chinese people before. But the movie Bruce Lee came out. That sort of suddenly gave a different perception. And they saw, oh, do you fellas learn that stuff at home? We'd better be careful. Can you teach us? Um, so that's quite interesting, you know, and it's probably similar to um, our brother Israel, the MM, MMM fighter. Um, he said he was taunted, um, you know, in his early time. I bet no one taunts him now. So, you know, that sort of um, perception is a very big thing. And we all stereotype sometimes and we all feel oh this is how people are and but however um that's that was one of those little stories i relay and i said wow that really had a huge impact when they saw bruce lee and jackie chan and all those people back in the 70s and there was a huge respect back again you know what i mean any one of the Panels want to respond to that question? Oh, I'll, I'll have a I'll have a go, Hemi. Um, I look. I think it's interesting, right? Because growing up, you're just a little bit more naive than when you are an adult, and the reality of the world really sits on your shoulders. So, as I was growing up in New Zealand, I think I was really unaware of the level of racism around me. Um, for example, it was only till I got to uni that I realized, whoa, I like, I know nothing about the history of New Zealand. Um, so I've just gone through secondary school in this country and have learned very little about Māori, uh, very little about the history of this country. And what I probably knew was about the Kapahaka group and that's as, as good as it got. Um, and that's when you realize that actually so many of us kind of go through a system where we can not see what's happening right in our midst. Um, has it gotten better or worse? I, I actually think when your conscience is, conscience is raised, you realize that things were bad and are progressively getting worse. Um, I, I mean, I think it's great that uh, we now can teach New Zealand history in, in schools, uh, but I think it's such a shame that the government has a policy where uh, communities that come into this country don't have an, uh, an opportunity to interact with Māori. So where we're able to build all these other forms of policies and programs to allow communities to actually just be with each other, there's a, there, there is no opportunity for those communities that are coming in to New Zealand to be able to engage with Māori in a positive way. Why is that? Like, why are we not actually making efforts to do that? Uh, where we talk about issues of social cohesion, it would completely change the landscape of this country. Um, so from where I sit, I think I was naive as I grew up around here, um, only to learn that actually there's so much that we need to do to change our society, to make it more equal um, for everyone. Thank you so much. I've got a, um, I've got a couple of questions about the Tiri Te Waitangi, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll cycle back to those um, in a moment. Um, and I'm really interested to find out, um, you know, I perhaps overheard a little bit of your conversation before we went live about, you know, facing negative comments in our everyday lives, particularly because of the mahi that we do and the communities we belong to. When, when, when you're faced with such situations, how do you respond and how do you feel empowered to continue pushing, pushing forward? Shall I go? <laughs> so, um... Yeah, so Dr. Dr. Arama and I were speaking earlier before we started, um, and I was just acknowledging the bias that um, some of us, we, we come from communities where we take up the responsibility of not only our day jobs, but to serve our communities because they are new migrants, former refugees, under-resourced, um, settling in. Uh, and how that's perceived in your work environment um, is not necessarily welcomed, you know. Um, 
it's seen as you being too involved or um, you it might be somehow impacting your day job even though there's no, there's no evidence to suggest that it impacts your performance of anything workplaces should see that as an employee that um, is doing well outside of work um, and if it's impacting their well-being outside of work in a positive way then it would naturally impact their well-being uh, at work in a positive way however that's not the reality for so many people of color who I predominantly work with and particularly in public service where it's not seen as a positive thing it's immediately branded as a conflict uh, where you have the ability to manage so many other conflicts um, effectively this becomes a conflict that you just don't you want to wash your hands uh, from and so I was just acknowledging the reality of that in New Zealand for so many people of color who are in public service who find it difficult to navigate the worlds that they they live in it, it, you know we've created a system where we're telling people that you are literally living in two worlds and there's no way that we want to create um, a system where they can come together and be okay and asynchronous with each other thank you Tayaba. have we got josiah back Talofa, can you hear me now? Sorry, I dropped out there. Thank you. Yes. yes. Oh, fantastic. So just to double check, I, 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 I did miss some of what was said. I apologize, team. Um, but I understand we were talking about our experiences when we were younger and whether things have gotten better or not gotten better and what we need to do to help make things, to, to, to get to the next stages. Is that right? Um, yes, yes, that, that is it. And, and we, we were just talking about, you know, in, in our everyday lives, sometimes we we can be subject to negative comments because of the mahi we're doing or connected with. Oh, yes. um, just just wanting to um, open up that conversation, you know, what, um, you know, how do you respond and how do you feel empowered to continue with your mahi? Yeah, well, I often find a number of people will ask me, will ask why do I why do I feel it's okay to have a voice or why do I feel it's um, okay to, to be part of the things that I'm part of and and often my response is well I'm not doing it by myself like I so said partly you know <laughs> if you're doing something by yourself it, you know it can put you in a bit of a, a bit of a difficult place but my but my community and my family support me and so ultimately if there's criticism or People are like, oh, that's too radical or you're challenging things too much. Um, I, I just kind of go back to what matters to my family. And there have been times when my family have, have been like, oh, that's quite risky to say that. Or it's quite risky. to." But they ultimately, we, we just work through it. And it's just out of love that we, um, that we, we, get, we get to where we need to go. So it's just taking it taking it slowly but with the community yeah with total call that as well just the um importance that if you're like doing this type of work having good people around you and to just notice when your friends who are doing this type of work as well are struggling this is the last one can we have a little bit sorry just having some interruptions here hey so bye did you finish your point? Um, probably I'd just add that um, just understanding um, the intensity of hate that different communities experience and the different forms that that takes, I think is um, important. As a person from a marginalized community that's very large um, demographically, um, I feel like I'm not the target of a lot of the hate that other people experience. So with that comes, I guess, um, an awareness and working together with those people, lending your voice to different causes. I think if there are more of us saying the same thing, then there are fewer, it's like not so easy to target um, just a few individuals. So yeah, um, having that community consciousness in mind, I think is important. Thank you. And, and uh, the, the, the interactions that we have are part and parcel of this online uh, world that we're in. Uh, tēnā koe. 
Um, let's let's circle back to the Tariti questions, and I think a question for all the panelists is um, firstly, kia ora. Do you think younger generations frame issues of te tiriti differently to their parents? Um, I'll have a stab at that one. <laughs> um, yeah, some, some people kind of accuse Māori of having like this revisionist interpretation of te tiriti because our interpretation of te tiriti that's used by the government, used officially, has kind of shifted over time in different ways. Um, you know, when the treaty was first signed, um, not long after that, the government passed legislation to amend what the treaty actually said because the government realized, oh <coughs> goodness, we've signed this document that we didn't actually understand. We didn't know what it meant. We didn't We didn't mean to give Māori tina rana tina tana. So let's pass legislation to retrospectively change what was in there. You know, so if anyone's doing retrospective perspective interpretation then I think it's the crown but um, I think there has been like some pragmatism in how the treaty's been used so um, you know we've allowed people to extract some principles for the, from the treaty because that was pragmatic and people thought it would be useful to do so um, and there's been lots of versions of that but there's been this continual thread which uh, from Māori which has been to return to the kupu of te tiriti or waitani which is the treaty and although that's always been, I guess, um, the goal, it's taken us a little while to get there. So I think today um, we see this some shift in language. So instead of tino rana tiresanga being watered down to mean self-determination, we're seeing people embrace the fact that it means independence. Um, yeah, so um, there has been this shift, but I think it's a shift back to what was actually in Te Tiriti Waitangi. Yeah, no, queer. Any of the other panelists want to tackle that question? I think, um, look, on, on the ground, um, I can see, I, I visibly hear and see um, our students participate more in uh, tikanga Māori, uh, in, um, in more aspects of uh, Māori life than um, my parents or even myself. Um, I'm not that I'm myself, I'm, I'm, I said my generation. Um, I can see, you know, um, even uh, very Pākehā schools are actually embracing um, Tao Māori in their, in their um, in their schools, and um, I see a lot of um, aero reports uh, in terms of vision and mission. And schools are embracing uh, the uh, the tikanga um, of Māori than themselves. So it's 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 a journey, right? It's a journey. And the next thing, like um, our panelists have said, and uh, congratulations to the prime minister um, that they're going to teach uh, New Zealand history in schools as well. And um, it's actually incumbent for uh, us to make sure that this happens as well. Um, and I, I dare say that each area will have their, uh, not only the general history um, of New Zealand, but also bespoke. Uh, in your town, your mauna, your awa, your marae, what was that uh, market garden shop down there? Uh, what was that chook farm just general stuff that um, just to bring us together so that we can actually say oh is that what the Dutch people do or the Chinese people do or the Muslim people do and then you know it changes the stereotyping that um, whatever they're thinking that, that we actually all have a valuable contribution uh, to community uh, but definitely, we know the construct of um, Te Tiriti is definitely changing um, as we talk today. Thank you, Bing, and thank you for the um, update on the flight leaving details. Um, let's, let's just take a break from some of those questions and come back. I've got one in the chat I'm going to raise um, to, the, to all the panellists. Can you comment on the place of peoples who have had colonial racism carried out on their ethnic and cultural identity? 
into the culture of Aotearoa, specifically the way Roma or Romani and other clans in Aotearoa, New Zealand received the racial slur gypsy. Uh, used without respect of our spirit and cultural origin. Likewise, the misappropriation of our lifestyle and appropriation of features of our peoples. Anybody want to respond to that question? I can. I, I can't say it's something that in my life experience or in our work with Pacific young people that we have much visibility of, but, um, it, but it is to say that every person in Aotearoa, regardless of your culture, including deaf culture, all cultures deserve the ability to be able to live and be as you are. And for people to have taken elements of who you are and to have misappropriated those to perpetuate myths uh, or other things that they, for whatever reason, isn't good enough and there's times when we kind of like oh you know we we we, we that's all right we, we give space for it but actually if it's important to you and it's something that that is a, a way of your life and and your way your community's way of being that's being mis mistold and 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 that's hurtful then we across Aotearoa have to listen and actually in doing so and and this is probably the the, the bit that matters to me so deeply is this is how we lead to the decrease in suicide this is how we lead to the increase in mental well-being these things have direct benefits to destroy colonization and to empower people who might not have had that 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 that, that support in other ways before and so it might feel like a small thing not saying that that comment that joke but it's not a joke and and it actually adds to to that distancing of people when ra when really what we've got the opportunity to do is show that we're actually much closer and where we're not close, learn, learn and more learning. Mm. And I'd just like to support those comments that you made there, Josiah. Um, they're really important. And thank you to the person who raised that issue as well, because it's um, not something that I've heard um, many people draw attention to and that could be reflective of the size of the community but the size of the community um, doesn't have anything to do with the size of the issue right so um, you know I've driven past um, uh, there's a place close to where I live where there's the gypsy fear that turns up you know so it's um, re we're recognizing the the damage that hearing that comment does um, but also it's, it's much bigger than that there are people whose entire lifestyle in New Zealand is centered around appropriating that culture. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a there's a need for more fora like this where people can expose us to some of these issues um, that might not directly affect us, but um, need to be given um, attention because I guess this just kind of speaks to how ubiquitous racism is in our culture and how it um, so much of the language that is used is based on really racist ideas. Um, so thank you for raising that. Um, yeah, uh, I think one of the conversations I hear regularly is about is about taking ownership and control of our own narratives. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it starts with checking that those narratives are correct. It is, it is actually what's held in the, in the minds and the hearts of the people that those narratives are, are about. Um, and, and I think it's also about coming together in solidarity in our in our shared experiences. Um, so a couple of questions, I think you might be able to fold them fold them into one. And in a nutshell, what is something practical we can all do to play a part in tackling racism? Um, and I'll, I'll ask them separately. In, in a nutshell, what's something we can all do? How can we contribute? Oh, um, I, I would say in two ways. Uh, first and foremost, talking about racism and normalising that so people can understand what racism actually is. Um, and secondly, not being a bystander. So when you see a racist incident taking place, that you're not there as a bystander, but that you're there to, you know, 
support the person who has actually gone through that experience or that you say something so the other person recognizes that what they did was not okay. And I would just add to that um, one thing that I think we can do to fight racism is, um, and this is, may seem like a small thing, but I think it's quite important, and that is to um, have a plan for when somebody calls out our racism. So just because you're from a marginalized community doesn't mean that you can offend other people and hurt other people through the things that you say, um, your actions and so forth. And so understanding, you know, what's the process here? Because I think what people often do is to deny or defend what they did. Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way, right? Um, and so, and what that does to the person who's raised this issue that's been brave enough to say, look, that hurt my feelings, is it denies their reality, right? It gaslights their experience. Um, so uh, if somebody does say, hey, that wasn't cool, that thing that you said or that you did, um, taking a moment to like, feel your feelings, to hear what they're saying and try to put it in place like a bit of a strategy. And often um, like Robin D'Angelo talks about um, white fragility and that's probably a good resource to go to. She talks about things like um, having people that you can go to outside of that relationship um, where you can express like, oh, this is so confusing. This is new for me. Um, this is how I feel. This is my side. And you can kind of have that moment to process things in that, that you feel you need to process before you're in a position to be able to go back to that person um, to restore the relationship if that's what the other person wants. So yeah, I think having a plan in place, uh, not just for racism, but for um, you know ableism, homophobia, transphobia, um, lots of different things I think is, is a useful strategy. Thank you, Adam. And of course, at the top of that plan should be your own personal uh, well-being and safety. Um, mm. to, 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 to add into that mix. Um, thank you. Yeah, if I could add, um, I think um, studying at school will be a very important part. Um, I, I find that um, our children actually have a lot of influence. Um, in all of our behaviours. Um, I remember when we started recycling um, in Tairawhiti, um, it was actually the children says, no, mum, 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 dad, dad, the, um, the bottles actually go in the recycling bin in this colour, um, not chuck it into the rubbish bag. And so slowly and surely, uh, we, we actually put a lot of focus on our students. And I think the, uh, the notion of like Kiva, Kiva, which is a, uh, a anti-racism program, bullying program in schools, where they actually teach constantly um, uh, what is racism, how to deal with it, um, supporting the victim as well as the perpetrator, um, having, having um, uh, conciliatory um, get-togethers on restorative restorative processes is important um, bringing the family in is important um, obviously you know willing willing parties obviously um, but I, I think not to um, leave the perpetrator high and dry as well because they may not know at that young age because they've actually um, heard it from home or been taught at home uh, because, you know, racism is not a biological thing, it's a societal issue. And so uh, definitely, I would say, start at the young age. There are people that are not going to change. Um, but there's two H's they can go to, heaven or hell. Thank you, Ming. Um... Thanks for your contributions to the conversation so far. Can you tell us about your best memory of learning about a different culture and feeling connected to it? Yeah, mimicking my customers when I was seven. Um, regardless of what nationality they did, I was actually mimicking the accent exactly how it was and then um, them telling me no 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 don't say that <laughs> because they are the naughty things that we we're saying to you and so it was actually quite good and then um, our 
all our uncles and aunties of Pākehā Māori, Chinese, they took us under their wing and um, guided us through the different language aspects and, and, and culture too. You know, the culture living and being there with the lived experience of positiveness also um, helps. So, uh, thanks to our elders. One of mine was when I got asked to support a, a, a well-being initiative for a new group of young people who were setting up uh, a, a well-being support group. It was a group of Somali young people in Christchurch. And as someone who have, has Somali friends, but had very little to, apart from just yeah, hanging out here and there with my, some of my mates, being involved and hearing their their stories about something that was a different life experience to me, something that I had done, I'd done nothing to earn the privilege of hearing their stories. But um, because we were friends, they, and, and, and what I get up to in the youth wellbeing space, they asked me to come and be involved. And, and there ended up being some really neat things I could share from my, my experience of growing up as a New Zealand born Pacific person that was quite similar. And, and, and I learned so much to, to, to help and think about how our Pacific young people might be better supported. So yeah, it was just being open to, to, to shoot, just to sit there, be there because I've been invited and, and then just being myself, not trying to, not trying to do anything different, but just be me. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you, just so. Yeah. And for me, um, you know, uh, most people think Muslims are all the same culture. <laughs> so actually, I learned about diverse cultures by going to the mosque as a young person and, you know, learning about Muslims from all walks of life. And it was one of the best times of my life. And second to that would be playing Kalikiti in, in high school and like hanging out with Samoans and really just learning about how much more we had in common in terms of respect for elders and how we're collective cultures. Um, that's how I learned, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your, um, for your answers. Um, so how can we support our Muslim whanau? Just um, carrying on from that conversation, Teaba. How can we support our Muslim whānau who continue to suffer and struggle from racism? And, and the, this, this question is, is, um, is aimed particularly at those um, who are affected by the attacks. Yeah, um, look, the journey for healing doesn't have a blueprint yet, mm. you know. Um, and so we really do need to treat those who have been impacted by that, those those terrorist attacks as individuals who are going to need their very own individualized healing plan. Um, and we need to be okay with that rather than adding a cost figure to it mm -hmm. and thinking about it in terms of, well, you know, if we don't think of them as a collective and if we don't put a time stamp on it, it's going to cost us X amount of taxpayers money because that, that's how we've been discussing their healing journey and that's what the narrative has been in the mainstream um, and that's not going to help anyone that's not going to help them because we're giving them messages that they're already a burden even though they have actually just gone through what is the most devastating act of violence that we've seen in our recent times New Zealand's it's not like this hasn't happened historically but certainly recently you know um uh, it's quite raw. So I think we need to start with that. We need to start with changing how we talk about the healing process for them. Um, and like, uh, you know, Dr. Arama said earlier, we do need to think about a compensation package for them if that's what they want. Um, we need to listen to them. And so centering their voices around that is essential and keeping that there for as long as it needs to be till they're ready. Um, that, that would be where I sit with that. Kia ora. I'm so sorry I'm an hour late. I was just checking to see if the Zoom was still going. Um, I hope you've all had a good discussion. I'm sure you have. Yeah, I just want to say welcome, Julie, but also um, welcome and goodbye from Ming. 
<laughs> but also to um, acknowledge everyone's contribution today. Fa'afetai, um, assalamu alaikum. Um, kia ora, uh, toje. Um, we've had an enriching conversation, and this is not the last of the conversations, and I really appreciate um, all of the conversations that happened today, but also mihi to our HRC team, team Shema Hemi, um, and other people that may be online. So come mihi te um, My call is coming, and so um, we'll see you another time. Uh, kia ora, e kona. Kia ora, meng haerera. Um, we are fortunate to have you with us for the time that you have been here. Travel safe. Um, Julie, welcome, welcome. I had this this wonderful um, intro for the mahi that you do. I might just cycle back to that and um, and bring you into the conversation. Um, I think we're going to be able to share a link to your latest podcast podcast immigration with my immig immigration with my immigrant parents um, and. Um, we're really interested in, um, in what inspired you to start the podcast conversations uh, with my immigrant parents and, and how you think it plays into the dialogue around race unity and race relations. Um, yeah, so um, we made the podcast as um, a way to, uh, because we were really interested in our own um, relationships with our parents and just how perspectives change with different generations and um, kind of the disparities that are caused by living in diaspora, what's changed between families, but a lot of the themes that come through in the conversations uh, we think are pretty universal so the conversations aren't always about immigration or racism a lot of that is in there as well but it also covers everything from like mental health to um, sexuality and gender and um, parenting what it means to have kids or not have kids uh, so we think that um, it just reflects kind of the universality of experiences the immigrant experience but also just families experiences and we wanted to like normalize and humanize people um so yeah just kind of connecting people um and having people speak for themselves because a lot of the time immigrant stories are told from maybe our perspectives like the people who are immigrants in this call who um maybe a second generation 1.5 who um experience life in Aotearoa different from our parents' generations who immigrated um, and maybe struggled with language and other barriers. Uh, and a lot of the time, yeah, the immigrant experience is led by our voice. Um, but this was one way where we could have kind of old generations speak for themselves in their own voice as well. So yeah, that, that sort of sums up the podcast. Well, thank you so much for um, for responding to that question. Um, we, we have been asking all the panelists this next question, and I want to give you an opportunity to to contribute. Um, so we we talked about a range of things that are going on and the work that you're involved in, and one of the key questions that's come up in the chat is, in a nutshell, what is something practical we can all do to to play a part in tackling racism? Have you got any advice? Um, something I've been thinking about a lot recently is just I would love for us all to think of racism as bigger than just interpersonal racism and violence against individuals or perpetrated by individuals but focus on more towards how the system that we live in and the different um, aspects of society whether it's employment, housing, um, health education, like how all of those aspects um, are institutionally racist or perpetuate uh, systems that hold certain communities down. Um, I think the more that we can help all of us understand systemic racism and how that impacts on um, interpersonal and individual racism, the more we can create bigger change and not just, because um, I think it's like most people we know are against racists and most people don't even like to be labeled racist, even racist people. So it's like everyone knows that's bad, but how can we communicate that 
actually all of us have been um, brought up in a system that has made us this way or yeah um, yeah just just framing it in a bigger way I don't know if that's a tangible thing but I think having conversations that go beyond just racism is bad but um, more the system that has stemmed in Aotearoa from colonization is what has caused it to be bad and that is what we need to change and um, finding ways to decolonize in small and big ways is what we need to aim for. Sure, well, thank you, Julie. That's some um, some wise wise advice, some sage advice. Um, okay, let's get back into the questions at hand. We've got it's twenty past six now. Um, oh, the, the, the three questions. I'm going to try and make them one. It's very hard to survive if you belong to people of colour. What are your thoughts on the fact that many of the migrants come from countries that have been colonised? While you're thinking about that, I just want to raise probably not so much a question, but there's some suggestions about, you know, having some um, a slogan, something catchy in a, in a campaign is the anti-racism slogan, or maybe we can think of one and make some suggestions. Sorry, was that question just for me or was that for everyone? Oh, sorry, to the panel. Oh, okay. Well, that's Christian's just disappeared. Sure, I'm willing to give it a crack. Uh, um, can you please just tell me, Hemi, if I haven't understood this, but the question was people, many people who journey here or who come here end up coming from colonized countries and coming to another colonized country, what can we do to support them or what? Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's levels of colonization, isn't there? So there's our, the colonization that's happened for Atanga Tafenua here and then the other countries that are in special relationships with New Zealand because New Zealand colonized them. So, and then the wider Pacific region, which New Zealand has participated in the colonization of. So there's a lot of us here who, who have directly felt the effects of the colonization. And I suppose one thing that comes to mind for me is maybe the government and other leaders could bring more people into the conversation who have had that lived experience of these challenges and not just bring in in a token way or in a way where that's not i'm talking about paid it's a paid job really <laughs> and we saw that after march 15 as someone who lives in christchurch and who helped respond in the mental health context after the attacks we saw iwi leaders and 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 hapu leaders come from across the country to journey with the families and while not all of them have come from colonized countries per se, there was something specific that only could be brought when someone who had a lived experience of lived experience of pain of, in that case, it was discrimination, racism, and terrorism. But that is something that is a real thing. In mental health, we have roles across our different health organizations called peer peer led or peer leaders or or and um, that's that feels like something that could be done in, in all areas and it often would leads to better outcomes because it's not that people aren't necessarily looking for support from from the, the professionals it's just that they want to feel seen and be able to maybe talk at, a, at lots of different levels about their experience and so that that I, whoever's put that comment there i think it's something that could be a big help in a lot of different situations, but specifically in what you're describing, provided that it's resourced. Sure. Thank you, Josiah. And if you wanted to check out uh, Julie's podcast, it's up in the chat right now. There's a link there. Um, cycling back, so let's. Um, you, you've you've all been through multiple journeys, 
uh, which no doubt comes with its ups and downs, as some of you have, have outlined. Um, have you got any other advice to our rangatahi uh, in Aotearoa who are still perhaps at the beginning stages of the learning journey and understanding how to, more, how, to become, how to become more inclusive and to feel like you belong in Aotearoa, New Zealand? That's a question to all the panellists. I kind of think that rangatahi are way more schooled up than all of us are. Like I keep meeting these young people who have all these progressive, amazing thoughts and um, just so much more than I had thought of when I was that age. So I kind of think the young people got it. Like social media is so educational. I know it has lots of downsides as well, but um, the way, the rapid way that um, perspectives are being shared and encountered and then developed and progressed, I just think is so cool. Um, and I just can't wait for more young people to like take power and make things happen. It's exciting. Thank you, Julie. Anyone else on the panel wanna have a go at answering that? Um, maybe just uh, one thing to add to that might be about um, sometimes the sometimes the need to be inclusive starts with ourselves. So um, as a young person, just looking at your life, um, feeling your way through your experiences, maybe maybe we could ask ourselves, what are the pieces of myself? I'm being asked to, to cut away to, to be in this place, whether it's work, um, university, school, um, your sports teams, whatever it might be. Um, how am I being forced to, to not show up as a whole person in these spaces? And um, that might be a starting point to just start to observe um, yourself and the, the parts of yourself that society is telling you um, make you not worthy, make you not as good as others. Um, the, the other thing that I would, um, that I sometimes see, um, it take a little while for people to develop um, and certainly took me a while to develop is really just faith in myself and faith in my community. So, um, you know, we, it's very easy to inter internalize the negative stereotypes we're being told about ourselves. Um, and, you know, for Māori, it's that, you know, I mean, I don't need to repeat them, but basically that um, we need the crown to solve our problems for us. Um, and we don't, we, we really don't. We have all the solutions that we need um, to, to be independent, to solve our own problems, to, to, to lead ourselves. So, those would be, I think, starting points um, that I would hope our young people um, take on board. Thank you, Arama. Uh, just a comment, uh, I think, to you, Julie. Good comment too, Julie. Love your podcast. Called it all so important to tackle racism, and you do that so perfectly. And I think. I think the, the conversations we're having now um, cont is contributing to that space as well. Um, so, a couple of questions around anti-racism, perhaps a slogan, a sentence or a slogan or something that's going to motivate, challenge, um, get people to examine their own thinking around around what, what racism, racism is. And I think I'll put this out to everybody on the call. So um, any of our participants got any ideas of a slogan or a sentence? We'll give our panelists a chance to have a drink or take a breath um, and see if you can contribute to that, to that critical thinking. Because, you know, it's, it's a bit like, you know, when you hear the when you hear the slogan "Make it click," you know it's about it's about um, it's, it's about seatbelt safety. Um, 
So, yeah, is, is there something that we can leverage off already? Um, Yeah, I think there are lots of slogans out there, aren't there, for different movements and and really a slogan by itself doesn't do much. It's more about all the work that goes around that. Um, yeah, so um, and I'm sure it takes people a long time and lots of negotiation with the communities that they're working with to come up with slogans that fit. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't think I could like drop any slogans in um, today. <laughs> So apologies to the person who raised that question. You won't get a slogan out of me today. Thank you. Um, oh, maybe this one's down on you. I, um, it's just shame over here. I guess just um, one thing as well, talking about rangatahi. I was wondering, um, you know, Julie, your point is so great that young people, obviously, they are a lot more woke or whatever the terminology is. Um, but I'm just thinking, um, you know, a lot of cases have come up in the in a lot of communities of color of young people um, being vulnerable um, to attacks because of racism. And certainly in Ototahi Christchurch, that's been happening quite often as well. And I guess my question to you guys would be, you know, what, what advice would you have to those younger people from the communities of color who are experiencing racism day in, day out, um, and sometimes feel like almost, you know, there's, there's, they're a little bit helpless or hope or hopeless. What would your advice as, as advice as people have made it out on the other side and are doing just such incredible things? Um, yeah. What, what would it be to them? Um, and, and I kind of hope that also Josiah was here, but he's dropped out um, because obviously it focuses a lot on on that mental health health aspect as well. I think Julia, I was going to say, um, for me, I think it's about finding community, which I know is hard, like just saying, like make friends and find your people is hard, but I think that is what's helped me like I think that um even in a way um if and when I do experience aspects of racism now I have such a strong community around me who I know um will be supportive and think um have similar kind of thought um patterns as me around issues of race um and I don't know it, it feels like racism aspects of racism sure they still happen um in the normalized world way but the impact of that personally the trauma of that is so much lessened because i think i have such a great community around me yeah i don't know if that's helpful yeah it definitely is um and i don't know but do you guys um have any advice for your younger selves <laughs> Yeah, hey, I, I mean, I, as, as Julie was talking, I was thinking community is, um, the word community can mean different things to different people, right? And um, it is sometimes hard to find depending on what you're looking for. But um, it is definitely a source of strength if once, once you find it, once you find your tribe and they're able to lift you up every time or whenever you go through something quite negative. Um, but I think the most important, the most important thing I would have told my younger self if I was looking back is the ability to have a conversation with someone you trust and feel safe with when you go through something like an act of racism. Um, there's nothing worse than going through something like that alone and trying to figure out what happened and whether it was even whether it was in your head and you know whether it was about you. Um, to have someone to talk to and offload with is, is so cathartic. And if I could tell my younger self that, that's what I would do. Oh, kia ora. I'll, um, Arama, did you want to add to that as well? Yeah, so um, 
growing up, I um, I didn't experience the um, the threat to my personal safety that's been described here. Like um, on the street attacks against Māori are quite rare, or they were for me growing up. Um, so the only types of you know physical threat that I faced was probably just gender-based violence would be, you know, the, the moments where I would have felt safe as uh, unsafe was due to that. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with the points that were made around having people to talk to. Um, I grew up in a very white place with not very much diversity at all. So most of the people that I was around, my friends at school, most of them were white. And if they weren't white, then they were trying to fit in with, um, with the Pākehā majority. Um, and what happened through through that process is that um, I think we, I, I certainly used humour a lot. So my high school friends actually think I'm hilarious. None of my friends today think I'm hilarious, but at high, at high school, people just laughed um, no matter what I said. And I noticed it years later when I caught up with friends and they were laughing every time I opened my mouth, even when I was being serious. So I guess that was kind of the, the the coping strategy that I fell into unintentionally and um, and unwillingly um, was for everything I said to just be funny because um, no one could take me seriously, right? Um, yeah, but certainly being able to talk through your experiences with, with people help. And it wasn't until really I got to university that I had lots of Māori people around me, lots of role models that we could like <laughs> thrash out these, have these like big conversations, kind of unpicking the experiences that we were having. Um, so yeah, having people to talk to is, is huge. Kia ora, maybe I can speak to um, my own personal experience of racism. Um, and I haven't always looked like this. Um, so I was experiencing racism um, as a young person. And that had a huge, huge impact on me and, and being fuck a mom, um, being embarrassed, being ashamed to be Māori. So it took me my whole life to be proud to be Māori. Um, and now I wear my tāmoko. Um, it, it, it's, it's a symbol that, that I am... I am reclaiming my whakapapa and I am reclaiming my culture, but it also is still quite polarizing. Um, there are people that react well and come up and say, hey, that, that looks cool, tell me about it. And I, I'm, I'm happy to share and speak about my experiences, but other people will look down their nose and cross the street. And it's still a very real dynamic in modern Aotearoa, New Zealand. And, you know, the reason, the reason I do the mahi that I do is because I don't want my children and mokopuna, my grandchildren, to have to go down that same street and experience the things that I experienced. So, um, quite polarising, carrying, carrying our, our cultural markings. Um, but it, it kind of outs the racists, the, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite obviously uh, racist when because of their behaviour. That's all I can say. Um, but I have I have acquired many skills to try and help me with that. And one of that was what you've just what you've just um, described as having one person in your life who you can trust and who you can reach out to. Uh, because if you haven't got one person that you can talk to or trust then you're on this um, downward spiral of depression most often. Uh, and that's from my, my, my background working in suicide prevention. Um, and I'm really just trying to bring through some of that mental health, mental well-being stuff, um, contributions that Josiah was contributing when he was, when he was still in, in touch with us, <laughs> when he was still able to connect. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your um, for your contributions. I'm wondering, are there any more? Oh, I was checking these questions down the bottom. Uh, young people are still so vulnerable. Cases of kids of colour getting attacked, getting attacked continue to happen. Yes, I think um, that, that is the case, but we have a lot more resilience now. 
Um, and I think there's also more ways of keeping yourself safe. One of those ways is to have someone, a trusted person that you can speak with. Um, to our panelists, um, I think we need to start perhaps winding up our, our hui. Have you got any closing thoughts, any closing whakaro for our, for our participants? Maybe I'll start with you, Julie. Kia ora. Um, yeah, apologies again for um, having double booked and having my mahi go over time and coming late. Um, sorry, I'm also just on the pavement. Uh, sorry. Um, I guess parting words, um, just wanted to say that, yeah, the racism isn't something that just um, is natural and is always going to be occurring. It's something that can be tackled. Um, but I think we need to look at the history of how it's come to occur. And I think that um, for Taui We Non Māori, um, acknowledging how colonisation has played a huge role in the experiences of racism that we all face uh, is a key like first step. Um, and making sure that we understand the intersectionality of all these issues that um, it's not just racism, but it's also impacted by um, gender, sexuality, disability. Um, and that's a conversation that also needs to happen as we try to address um, racism and um, oppression more broadly. So yeah, I guess just for all of us to um, just think, think more broadly than just how racism might affect us as individuals. Yeah. Hold up. Hold up, Julie. Should we go to Tayaba? Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for for having me um, with this wonderful panel. Um, it's always a Pleasure is probably an inappropriate word in this context, but it is a pleasure to talk about <laughs> this subject so that we're able to, to normalize it. And I think that that is my concluding point, um, that we need to normalize our ability to talk about racism when it happens so that there's more awareness of it. And that allows for us to really think about, you know, the systems that are in place that actually then impact every, you know, so many people across the board um, intersectionally. And so, yeah, I would encourage people to really view the world from like, hey, I just saw something and that, you know, was obviously racist, but I walked past it. But finding safe and ethical and appropriate ways to talk about it so that more people um, are aware of what of their unconscious bias and are able to to live in the world differently. Kia ora. Kia ora, kia ora te yawa. and te um, Yeah, just pick up. I think on um, on Julie's point um, about understanding those connections between our different experiences. I think is is really important so they're always there um, and it's not to say that we're experiencing the same thing at all but understanding the, the structures that underpin our experiences and how those are connected to the experiences of people in other parts of the world um, I think is really really helpful for solidarity building um, and I'd, I'd really love to see more solidarity um, work happening in Aotearoa so that when a community experiences an event, um, they have our full support um, and vice versa. Um, yeah, and and just I just want to um, I guess end on the power of of those reconnections and how important they are um, because I guess the the state and the way that 
settler colonialism has operated has has tried to eliminate us or exclude us. And so when we embrace ourselves and our culture and our cultural practices, that's actually really radical. So learning more about our, our own histories, our own cultures and enjoying them and being proud of them and sharing them with others and learning about other people's um, histories and cultures as well um, from a respectful distance, um, I think is, um, is really powerful. And the more we know about ourselves and the more appreciation we have for others, I think the easier it is um, to make those connections. Um, can I ask my commission colleagues if they have anything to add before I wind our webinar down? Um, thank you so much, um, Hemi, for your awesome facilitation and for our awesome panelists. We've seemed to lost, uh, lose um, Josiah over the way, but um, he's somewhere fishing in Aotearoa, so that's Kate Pai. Um, but yeah, um, no, just massive thank you to yourself and to um, everybody who joined in and um, the attendees as well. Shukran, Shema. Um, e mihana kia koutou. Kai ngā rangatira e, e, e harumai nei me ngā kōrero matapaki mo tēnei kaupapa. E mihi ana. Uh, I just want to join with Shame and thank you so much for uh, for giving us um, some precious time. Um, really exciting mahi that you have all contributed to, uh, including Joshua who's fishing, hopefully. Um, and and look forward to to tracking the mahi that you do going forward. Uh, I think we can all make some contributions to um, to tackling racism in Aotearoa um, and matato. It's up to us. It's up to us. Hui ano te neira te mihi te kia koutou. Kei ngā matanga, kei runga i te nei toko toko waia. Hori kau taku mihi kia koutou ko tō. I also want to acknowledge our participants who have joined in. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, participating in this in this great conversation. And it's an ongoing conversation. It needs to carry on, and um, we're happy to have that conversation wherever and whenever. No reira e rauranga tirama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'd like to close with the karikia. Kia tau tonu te rangi maere, ki rungi a tātou katoa. Ruia, 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 ruia. Ruia ki runga, ruia ki raro. Ruia ki waho, ruia ki roto. Ruia ki uta, ruia ki tai. Huana ki te rangi, turu ana ki nuku. Nā, kua tau, kua mau, kua ea. Ti hewa, mauri ora. Mauri ora ki a tātou. Mauri ora mai.